assalamu alaikum uh, welcome to odl lecture number 2 and today we are actually starting the induction motor design and uh, uh, this uh, title over here is actually the d square l design and as this lecture will end we will have actually a parameter which is called as d square l where d is actually the diameter of the inner bore of the stator and l is the length of the machine uh, by l i don't mean the length of the total machine as you can see in this image which is right in front of you uh, today's lecture the first part is actually related to the overall construction of the induction machine physically and mechanically i will be showing you some parts uh, this total machine right in front of you this blue color one and uh, then we are going to separate all of these and then i am going to show you what is actually inside this where is the stator where is the rotor we will talk about its stator and stator tamping then we have also going to talk about a little bit about the bearing the mechanical stuff the fan the rotatory fan and then uh, the first design equation will be coming on and at the end of that design equation this v square l is over here is actually going to be the end result of this today's lecture and uh, hopefully i hope you have everyone has revised what is an induction motor from my lecture 1a and 1b so let's get started okay the picture right here in front of you uh, the blue color machine over here uh, it's uh, it may be a single phase or a three phase but i am not concerned it may be a three phase also of the same shape but as you can see uh, this machine over here if i just zoom in a little over there this type of machine is called as a pad mounted induction machine these are the pad and we normally call it as the pad mounted induction machine or maybe it can be even a dc machine but the pad actually are these pads on which it has to be uh, inserted at somewhere with so the screw holes over there and then certainly this is the name plate as you can see over here this is the name plate the shaft over here is at this point and the junction box at which they are going to be control of those three phase and all that stuff now this induction machine uh, this actually comes if i just bifurcate this machine and if i open it in front of you this is something like this and as you can see the stator and the rotor have been actually opened over here and uh, if i can show you in a little zoom in over here the topmost uh, box over there and you can see that this is actually a uh, delta connection i guess if i'm not wrong or maybe there may be a wire but sir anyway this can be determined if you can see closely over there but you can see the three phases over there let me use some other color over here so this is your a phase this is your b phase and this is your c phase and certainly the three phase wire which you are actually going to bring in it's going to come in through this wire gland or cable gland and then it's going to be actually entering it and you are actually going to supply power from here the delta or y connection is dependent upon what type of winding you are actually designing over there now if i move on towards this inner side of the machine as you can see over there you can see a lot of uh, slots over there and in these slots the conductors are there and um, what you can actually see over here this portion where i'm actually rubbing this one and uh, finding it this one is called as the teeth of the uh, stator over there now why it is called as the teeth over there because from these teeth over there flux lines are actually going to originate from here and they are going to go towards the rotor over there now this marking or this material over there let me fact call this one uh, as with another material color over here this and circle region this one this one this one you can see a white paper type substance in which the winding is actually insulated this can be a paper if it is a simple uh, 230 volt or maybe or even a 400 volt line to line voltage but it can be a mica sheet or any asbestos sheet or something like that so this is actually serving as an insulation yes the wires are enameled the wires are enameled but they are not a uh, conductor from the upper side they will be only a conductor from the ends where they will be actually used in abrasive paper or a sand paper but overall these are uh, lining of the slots is done with this paper it can be a mica sheet or an asbestos paper or a simple paper or oil paper oil paper is also a very important paper we will discuss this later on when we discuss a little bit large size of machines so these are the stators 
So you can see over there, this blue color one inside it, there is a slot over there and inside this slot there is actually the conductor placed over there. And if you can see a little bit inside over there, inside this uh, over here, this all over here, this region of this wires over here, these are actually not the useful part. Why not the useful part? Because maybe a conductor is starting from here and then it is ending over here and then when it has to end over there, it has actually traveled the whole length and then it has come on from backside and then it has completed this path like this. The useful part which is actually going to produce that flux lines and all that revolving magnetic feed is actually this one and the, this one. This one over here, this portion and this portion is actually just a connection between the two conductors or the number of turns between these two coils over there. So this portion over here and this portion over here, we call this one as the overhang of the machine. Why it is overhang? Because certainly this is hanging beyond the length of the machine. Now one thing very important, I told you in the very start that there is a D square L parameter which we are going to find out today. So uh, the length of the machine which I am talking about is actually this length. That is actually the stator material over there. So this length vector or this length arrow is not equal to from this point. It is actually just inside the stator over there. This overhang or this windings which are just connecting the coils over there, they are not the length of the machine because they are not producing any flux from here. Even if they are producing, they are not being projected through the stator over there and you can see the length over here, that is the length of the stator is actually going to be the stator core that is actually made up of lamination. Now you can't zoom a lot in over there, but you can see these are certainly going to be made up of laminations in this direction. I will show you another picture just afterwards this one. So these are laminations which are stacked together and they are actually making the whole length of the machine over there. Now if I move my uh, study now to this rotor over there, now you can see over there the rotor is actually just a solid thing. It has no winding effect. But in practically, this is actually a aluminium based solid rotor in which you are using some silica, uh, some silicon alloy over there, which is actually 6 to 12 percent silicon added over there in the uh, aluminium, and then you have fabricated this, die casted this rotor over there. Now, when you are die casting this, this is actually the end rings. These two are the end rings over there. If I make them uh, name over here. And certainly these are the slots or the windings inside this uh, over here. So these are the slots or the windings or you can call them as the bars over here. Now these bars are solid. They are not windings over there. And the reason of actually them a little tilted. Now this tilting of angle, why they are tilted, if I just zoom in a little bit, you can see the arrowheads, they are a little tilted. They are not aligned in the straight direction. So this means there is some skewing over there. This concept of making them skewing is very, very important in an in induction motor design. And we will discuss when the rotor, I will tell you that why this skewing is done. But just for now, the skewing is actually done to avoid magnetic locking. That is actually the locking between the stator and the rotor. Or it is controlling the pulsating torques which are being done over there. So this is actually the rotor is made up of a silicon alloy which is 6 to 12 percent silicon added inside aluminium. Pure aluminium is not used. Uh, the very reason because it's not a very good molding structure. It will not be very good mechanical stability is not there. So just a little bit silica is added over there to make it a uh, aluminium silicon alloy over there and this is a die casted. But before die casting, this is very important, before die casting, the rotor was also made up of lamination. This is very important. Now when this is made up of laminations, the slots are empty and in those slots, there is aluminium port over there and that aluminium over here, you can see that aluminium over here which is in a little bit squid direction and then these are the two end rings over there. So you are having this end rings and then afterwards this hole is the shaft of the machine 
this one is a bearing over there certainly similar like this over there this bearing over here at this point this is taken out from the other end so when this machine is going to be again put back in a full configuration this bearing is actually going to go at this side over there and there is going to be the end plate or the clamp plate over there now what are the end plates clamp plates over there we will just see a little bit more in this picture over there now what you are seeing over here this is a very simple machine which has been bifurcated in all of its parts same blue color machine we saw in the very first picture now you can see over there this is a stator over there in which the rotor is actually being again the same fitted over there these are the pad mounts over there the screws are actually attaching it to the frame of the machine and then this is the bearing which is being uh, going to be inserted inside this rear end shield you can call it as the clamp plate or the end shield whatever you want to call it so this rear end shield and this washer plus this bearing they are going to be press fitted inside this one by press fitting i mean that it's this whole bearing has to be press fitted inside it and when the shaft is actually going to be inserted inside this bearing the bearing is actually going to be moving and the whole uh, a rear end shield is going to remain static and then they have a very simple oil seal over there oil seal is there because the bearing can be oil filled over there i will talk about different types of bearing just a little further over there and then the last end of the shaft is there is going to be a fan now what's the use of the fan over there now since the motor is going to radiate heat is going to radiate heat in form of core losses or maybe even i square r losses where that is going to go so that has to be dissipated and for that dissipation you can see the frame is made up of fins over there these fins are actually also going to dissipate that heat and this fan is also going to produce that airflow and this airflow is going to come on from this perforated shield over here so this fan cover or the fan clamp over there the fan clamp is actually just going to be just a screw over there which is actually going to guide it on that shaft so that when the shaft rotates the fan is also rotating so the purpose of this fan is actually just to put in pull in air from this fan cover over there so whenever you have must have seen this motor at your homes if you have a water pump at your homes this fan is actually just taking in air from that fan cover and it's putting that air inside the stator now inside the stator how this air will flow when i will discuss the stator stampings i will tell you on that part over there but if i go on the other side of this machine almost the same hierarchy is over there the only thing change is this that here there is no fan you don't need a fan over there because the air is actually being sucked on from the other side and one thing very important the fan when it is being uh, pulling the air it should be actually pulling in the air and then ventilating it it should not be the other way around otherwise it can be detrimental for the machine also so the blades of the fan is very important how you are actually going to make it so this is actually again the same washer the bolt is added and these are two different types of clamp plates over there as you can see over there so these are b5 flange or b14 flange these are mechanical terms we don't need to go in that much detail over there but overall this is the same structure of an induction machine and you can see over there and these are just the control uh, of the the terminal box over here in which all the windings connections are actually coming on and from here you are actually going to supply the power that is actually three phase over there so this is an induction machine three phase and this is total open mechanical space in which you are seeing this whole three phase induction motor with a stator and the rotor bifurcated now if i move on towards a little bit uh, more over here you can see a little bit another diagram with almost same thing nothing uh, exceptional over here from the last picture but one thing very very important over there which must i have missed over there if you see this long rod over there this long rod over there these rods are actually going to fix the end clamp plates over there with the frame of the machine this is very important over there because if i just zoom in a little bit over there you can see some screw heads over there these are the points or and you can see the screw heads over here and at this point over there so when the machine is actually going to be joined together the screw which is actually shown over here in fact i can just rub this off again and you can have a look at this so this is happening like this that you are actually having uh this rod is actually going to be the screws actually they are going to go through this pass through this pass through this and this is going to join together 
Now why this is very important over here this screwing it has to be very perfect and it has to be combining all the two end clamp plates so that the shaft is actually just in center. This is very very important. The shaft has to be in the very center. What I mean by that because if you have a stator supposedly and if I make a small stator over there and this is that stator over there and you now want to have a rotor attached in between. Now if that rotor is something like this you can see the air gap is almost uniform from all sides. But somehow if what happens that your rotor is actually just a little away from one side. So here the air gap is large, here the air gap is small. So what will happen? The stator is going to have an unbalanced magnetic pull. So this is called as the unbalanced magnetic pull over here on the rotor. So what is going to happen? The shaft of the machine it has now tilted a little on the other side and this reason can be either the bearing has failed maybe the bearing is not working correctly so this is very very important that the bearing should be a very good quality not some cheap bearing which will lose after it and secondly the clamp plates are not of some good iron or material over there so what will happen maybe the clamp plate become loose and it has some deformation the shaft will bend when the shaft will bend the machine will have now an unbalanced magnetic pull and because of that unbalanced magnetic pull the machine will be producing torque jerks but what I mean by torque jerks over there the point where it is actually closer it will be actually a different torque here it will be a different torque so what will happen this torque is going to be more than this torque over here exerted here so what will happen there will be torque jerks over there because if you remember in a machine if you have a central pivot over there and you have something you are putting force over here you are putting force over here the fulcrum on the fulcrum that starts to rotate over there but what's happening over here you have a more torque over here and you have a small torque over here so what is going to happen the motion is not going to be of the same speed it will have some jerks over there primarily you will not see anything different because the machine is running at a very high speed but if you do a very close analysis of the speed on some revolution basis you can find out this problem and this problem will deteriorate even more over there why because this gap is more this gap is small so what will happen it will degrade it more towards it because what is happening one side force is more the other side force is less so the rotor shaft will now bend and when this bending occurs the deformation is permanent and then maybe you have to replace the rotor or maybe do some mechanical engineering on that stuff so that it can be actually used over there again now so this one is the clamp plate so clamp plates are very very important the next thing very important over here as you can see over here the, the frame of the machine in which the stator slots or stator core is going to be placed this is actually made up of cast iron now this is very important why because the cast iron is very simple or in normal words if you talk about in Pakistan it's called as Degi Loha a simple iron melted with some impurities and just cast it inside some frame so that it can have now, but problem over here if it is having some impurities inside it it will not be able to take that heat from it because iron may be a very good thermal conductor but if it does not take heat it has impurities inside it what will happen the heat will be inside the stator and it will heat up the winding the winding resistance will increase and the machine will damage after some time so the frame is as important as any other part in this machine so the frame has to be made the next picture which you can see over here is actually the frame over there you can see this frame is actually made up of cast iron and the fins are on the outer side one thing very very important over there which is I tried to find out over here in this uh, uh, lecture but I could not find it one thing there will be some axial ribs over there by axial ribs I mean that there will be just like fin like structures inside the frame so that you can attach your stator core over there or laminations over there so these are going to be very very important over there and what I mean by that if I just go to the uh, stator I will just talk about this bearings a little bit over there uh, let me in fact show you if you see this stator laminations over there uh, these stator laminations there is a small cut over there if you can just zoom in over there this one this is a very very small cut over there 
Now the point of having this cut over here, this cut is also here at this point and this cut is also here at this point, it's also here and I guess uh, at some other point also. Now the advantage of having these cuts, these are axial ribs so that when this whole steel, silicon steel, all these laminations, they are going to be actually fitted inside this frame over here. The frame will actually, those ribs or these axial ribs, these are called as axial ribs over there because they are on the axis of the machine. What is the axis of the machine? The axis of the machine is like this one. So the axis of the machine, the ribs are there and when the stator laminations are actually going to be inside this one, they will disallow the stator core to move because sometimes uh, the force is being exerted the force is also being exerted on the stator coils over there as well because there is producing a revolving magnetic field. The rotor can have effect on the stator as well. So the stator core can also start to rotate. So just to avoid it, we have to make those axial ribs and those cut in those laminations so that the stator core is intact. We need that to be stationary. Only the rotating part is the rotor over there. So the frame is as much as important and if you go on towards your chapter number 8, uh, over here uh, in chapter number 8 when you are talking about the frames of the machine there are two different categories of the machine they are called as the small machines or the medium machines they have a different standard and if you have a larger machine then it is going to be going in a very large one and for small and medium machine they are actually attributing them equal to 200 kilowatt over there and if you are having more than that approximately larger ones can go up to like 10,000 kilowatts over there they take them as the larger machine so if you have a small or medium type of a machine the standard that is used is equal to IS1231 and it's actually a very old standard but still I guess this is used somewhere in Pakistan so the small or medium one the industrial standard is IS1231 and if you're talking about a larger machine which means it can go up till 10,000 kilowatts, which means actually 10 megawatts. Now, 10 megawatts is a huge machine. The standard for this one is actually 8223, and this is 1976 version over there. So, the, the name nomenclature is almost the same. So, what they do for the small and the medium machine, they have uh, the sizes already given. So if they want to make some mechanical uh, frame over there, they have fixed those sizes. Okay, we want something a 10 kilowatt machine. They have fixed those diameters and the length of those machines and you can play with the other thing over there. So the diameter and the length over there, which I will discuss shortly, D and L of the machine. D is not actually the physical diameter, it's actually the stator core diameter. That and the length of the machine is actually the length of the stator core over there. So this D and L are fixed over there and the reason of fixing actually over there for different classes of machine is that so that you can make it economical otherwise every manufacturer is going to have its own D and L so the frames are actually produced by some other industry and the other machine uh, and the other portion of the machine that is actually the stator core the rotor core and all other things are actually being done by the own industry whoever is designing that machine for larger machines uh, they don't try to use actually frames in circular nature. They actually try to use boxes over there and inside those boxes they try to fit that machine and if I have this one as uh, this one so the shaft is actually coming out over there. But again the main advantage of using uh, frames or large boxes for larger machines is this that you can actually open this top cover and you can go inside it. But one thing very important, the stator core has to be fixed with the frame. It should not be allowed to move over there. So this is very, very important over there. So this is about the frames over there. And I hope you can understand this one. Kindly go through the article 8.2.1. It's about the frame in your books. And I've tried to give you a little bit information. Now, if I move on towards the rotor, this is a small picture. As you can see over there, there are two types of uh, rotors over there. And you can see uh, in the first one, there is the slip ring rotor over there which is actually the wound machine and you can see the uh, three rings over there and these are those slip rings and in those slip rings you can see this is one this is two and this is three the carbon brushes which are sliding on the rings over there now these slip rings they are very very important and these slip rings are actually made up of uh, these slip rings these are actually the slip rings uh, in fact, let me just uh, 
I reduced it a little more. Okay, okay, it's not reducing. So these are the slip rings, and these are made up of brass or phosphorus bronze. This is very important. Why this is very important? Because this brass or phosphorus bronze is actually going to have a lot of heat. So there should not be no wear and tear. The erosion has to be very small. So what is happening over here? You are having a branch or so this is the brass or the phosphorus rings over here on the uh, slip ring rotor over there, and these are the carbon brushes being used over there. So these brass or phosphorus rings are done on the shaft over there, and in below this one there is a thermosetting resin on this one because this is going to be subjected to a lot of heat. So there is a thermosetting resin placed over there and then this brass or phosphorus rings are attached over there and then there is some carbon brushes attached over there so that they can actually bring those three phase connections out of that slip ring rotor as I told you in the last lecture also that the slip ring rotor is going to be having a very high starting torque as written over there and if I talk about the squirrel cage machine as I have told you there is a little bit squeeing going on and you can see they are not straight. The but they are not straight there is a little bit swing and this one is the end ring over here so you can see the end ring is actually just short circuiting over there so this shape of the cage rotor is actually just like a shape of a uh, cage or squirrel cage that's why it's called as the squirrel cage machine it has a very low starting torque but overall the efficiency and the maintenance of this machine is very very small so Otherwise, this machine is very much used, almost like 70 to 80 percent of the machines are squirrel cage machines. Slip ring machines are only used or wound machines are only used whenever you are going to have a little bit uh, difference of torque required or high starting torque as I have discussed in the last lecture. Now, uh, this is again the same uh, rotor or the rotor bars as you can see over there, the same end rings over there. These are simple fins added. I hope this doesn't confuse you. These rings or these fins are added just there to cool down the rotor so that when the rotor is rotating it can have some air flow over there and because of that air flow when the rotor is rotating this can give you a lot of air flow the temperature can be reduced over there plus there is vents on the both sides of the stator and the rotor lamination. So this is again a simple picture nothing fancy about it again this is a pad mounted over there you can see this stator slots over there the laminations if I just zoom in a little bit over there these are the teeth over there in which these are the teeth over there and inside this space this space this space this space these are the slots in which the windings are going to be these are the teeth which are going to be uh, having the flux flow from the slots flux is not going to flow this is very very important the flux lines are going to flow if I just zoom in again over there and if I show you with another color over here on this one, flux lines, if they are being produced, they will start to flow from here, they will start to flow from here, they will start to flow from here, they will start to flow. So the teeth are actually very important over there. From their teeth, the flux lines are actually going to flow. So the teeth are going to have a very different flux density. Why? Because if you can see over here in the teeth, the teeth shape is very much important how you can actually make the flux lines uniform. So the teeth, we will discuss them in very much detail how the stator slots and teeth are going to be designed. But just for now, this is again a simple diagram. You can see the end rings and the laminated sheets over there. The shaft and the conductor bars, as I have told you, there is a little bit squeeing over done over there. The end rings are also shown over here in this picture. So this is just the rotor. This is a squirrel cage rotor over here in picture, as you can see over there. Now, before I go on forward, there are two types of bearings used normally in small machines. Uh, one, this one is called as the roller bearing over there. Now, why this is called as roller bearings? If you can just see, zoom in inside this one. These are rollers. So when this whole, uh, when this center one is going to be placed just in the center and this is going to rotate, these balls, these are not actually circular balls, these are actually uh, cylindrical balls over there and when these are going to be rotating, they will be rotating in one certain direction so that the inner 
material which is actually this portion over there let me use another color on this one uh, so this one over here this is going to rotate and these balls over here which are cylindrical rollers actually they are actually going to be rotating over there this is called as a roller bearing over there the next type or another type of a roller bearing is this one this is called as two tapered roller bearing as you can see this is a cut shape over there these are rollers over here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 so there are 16 ball sorry roller bearings over here and these are on this side and certainly 16 over here on this side over there so this is called as a two taper so on two taper because it's on the both side in the previous picture it was just one in one angle over there so they could have it now these are a little bit expensive because of the roller bearings because there is a little bit fulcrum so that they can actually move over there the replacement of this one is actually the ball bearing and normally you have seen this one now instead of uh, the normal roller bearing this is called as a ball bearing a ball bearing over here and here inside you have spherical balls now those spherical balls are can move in any direction even if you can see over there this inner ring over here it's a little bit deformed it has a little bit angle but still the rotor will rotate why because these are balls and they are spherical in nature the bearings can withstand that so ball bearings are used wherever there is a little play in the rotor shaft so even if the rotor shaft is a little bit angle tilted maybe like one degree two degree or three degrees the ball bearings can adjust to it so ball bearings simple ones easy ones cheap ones but they are more susceptible to problems also because they are balls and these balls can actually have a wear and tear they are not assigned some axis over there so they can move in any direction over there and maybe one or two balls they actually worn out and they are not moving what will happen the shaft will have have an equal torque exerted on each point over there so these ball bearings very cheap one they are normally used in our machines a lot the small machines and the medium machines but a better alternative is actually this uh, uh, roller bearings over there this is a two taper or double taper and this is a single taper roller bearing as you can see over there now these are used in small and medium machines if i talk about a larger machine in a larger machine uh, they are used as the uh, they are used called as journal bearing now journal bearings uh, try to search on this journal bearing journal bearings are those bearings which are made up of oil in between which means that the inner ring and the outer ring there is a sealed oil chamber and since oil is a very viscous liquid this will allow the flux or the not actually the flux sorry this will allow the movement of the inner ring very easily and they are very expensive and because i'm talking about some big machines more than 10000 or nearly 10000 kilowatts or something in megawatts journal bearings are used and they have an oil chamber inside it but again they are expensive they have an oil over there and if they leak out centrally they you cannot have that journal bearing but yes journal bearings can withstand a lot of tilt angle in the shaft whatever so just google it out on journal bearings you have an idea what the shape of a journal bearing is over here okay now turning on towards our stator over here that is a stator and the rotor core as you can see over here in this picture i have shown you a stator and a rotor core both are there this is actually the stator core as you can see over there this is the stator core over here and if I just zoom in a little bit more, this is actually the slot or the stator slot over there. And this portion is actually the teeth of the rotor over there. Now, one thing very important, whenever a stator lamination is made, you have, as I told you previously and I showed you in the just a picture as well, there will be axial ribs here, here and somewhat here also so that when you are going to fit this whole stator core with all the laminations stacked together these axial ribs will make the movement of the stator core in any motion not possible so these stator cores now if you have a very small machine the dia is very small the stator core lamination which is shown in front of just of you this is going to be cut from one single piece of silicon steel sheet but if your machine is a very big machine and the uh, diameter is very large then you are going to actually make them in segments but making in segments means 
supposedly you have a very big machine something like this over there and this is the uh, stator total overall assuming this is a very big diameter so what you will do overall actually if this is the stator uh, core over there you will cut this one into three half and you will make this 120 degree half over here and this will have less wastage from the silicon steel material so even now in this uh, whole 360 degrees you are going to make some slots over there like this you are going to make slots opening over here like this you are going to make slot opening over here like this so you are actually going to save a lot of material so this all overall this is 120 degrees so you are going to make them in segments you can increase the number of segments if the machine is very very large but overall the stator core if you are designing a small and a medium type of machine the whole stator core is cut from one single piece as shown over here the same goes on for the rotor nothing fancy over here for the rotor the rotor you have to keep a keyway arrangement over there not shown over here in this diagram so that when the shaft is inserted inside it there is going to be a small keyway this is called as keyway over here this keyway is going to make the rotor shaft fixed with those laminations over there so that when the shaft rotates the rotor also rotates or if the laminations are rotating the shaft also otherwise it can be possible that the laminations are separated they are rotating but the shaft is not rotating so this is just an axial keyway over there that is actually just making the shaft of the rotor same definitions apply for the rotor as well this is the rotor teeth over there as I have told you the teeth are those points or areas from where the flux is actually going to enter uh, from here it is going to go towards the stator or inside the air gap which is certainly not shown over there and this is actually the slot over there the rotor slot in which certainly if it is going to be a squirrel cage machine there is going to be some molten aluminium with some silicon alloy added over here so the rotor and the stator slots are there and the rotor and stator laminations are there now as I told you there was a fan working over there and that fan has to pump some air inside it now if the machine is very big I am assuming the diameter of the inner machine equal to something near about more than 200 uh, centimeter then this means that you are going to have some air vents over there by air vents I mean there will be some cutted shapes over there in the stator core over there and they will be through out the stator core lamination which means they will be air vents and through those air vents air is actually going to be coming out over here so these are going to be air vents so these are going to be called as air vents over here and through this air vents uh, this is also an air vent this is also an air vent and they will be punched holes throughout this lamination and certainly when you are stacking them together you have to take into consideration that all those punch holes or air vents are in the same angle these are called as the uh, axial vents over there because they are, are on parallel to the axis of the machine over there so same thing can be done on the rotor as well but normally rotor since this is already rotating so normally they avoid those rotor vents over there and I told you there was fins added on the rotor shaft over there so that they can actually be used very easily so this was a stator uh, and the rotor core and they are made up of laminations another picture giving you another idea over there you can see there is a stator slot the laminations the shaft is there the keyway is still not shown over there uh, because this is actually a mechanical term so normally the keyway is not shown and you can see the axial ribs and the vents are also not shown but now here very very important since this is a cross-sectional view of a machine in front of you now let me decide on one thing very important and uh, we will since use this in the whole design of the induction machine since this is the center of the machine from the stator point from the stator point this dimension crossing through the diameter up till the stator not the rotor which means including the air gap this distance is called as B B is the magnitude of the or the distance between the inner bore of the stator remember this is the inner bore of the stator if I include from here to the end point over here certainly crossing to the end over here this will be a different distance we are going to call this one as the BFS 
that will be a different term we will talk about this how that is going to be found out depending upon the shape of the slot and the extra distance at the back but just for now this distance in the inner bore of the stator is going to be called as d over here so this d is the same d which i have talked to you in the very very start that was d square l so d square l the d over here is actually the diameter of the inner bore of the stator and the same machine if i show that machine in a longitudinal cut over there so what is going to be here in this fashion uh, this is going to be the stator cut this is going to be the uh, stator cut over there and the rotor which is going to be placed over here and this is the shaft of that machine over there so this is the stator this is the length of the machine and what is d over here if i just change the color a little bit just so that it's a little bit more legible so this is oh sorry not from here uh, from here to here this is d so I have you have an idea what I mean by D and L. D is the inner bore diameter of your stator and the L is the length of the stator laminations used over there. So if I take this definition now over here, what is D over here in this case? D is actually from the center, passing through the center, this is D, including the air gap, whatever. And what is L if this is actually the total length of the stack lamination? this will be the length over here this will be l of your now how many types of slots can be there what can be the shape of those slots that's a totally different thing we will discuss it in the next lecture but just for now as you can see these slots are very very deep these slots are very very deep inside now one thing before i proceed further deep slots are going to have more leakage flux and the only reason over here is this because when you are going to have deep slots the conductors which are here at the end over there in this slot they are going to produce a flux over here which will not go towards the rotor or the air gap it will retain inside the stator core so deep slots or in-depth slots they are not going to have very good reactance the leakage reactance is going to be more so you have to make a slot in such a way that all of its flux or at least 80 to 90 percent of its flux actually engages with the air gap or with the rotor over there so the flux lines which are retaining inside the stator core over there this this area this area over here you can call this one as the stator core over there since i have told you that this region over here is the teeth and in between those teeth you have a stator slot over there so this is a stator core as you can see and these are laminations stacked together over here and this is another shape of another uh, deep slots over there and one thing very important as I have told you previously this one this shape over here of this one is actually the teeth over here so the reason of making this one something like this over here so that when the flux lines are entering from here they actually have more wider area to actually go towards the rotor over there otherwise if it was just a simple thing like this what will happen you will have congested flux lines in a simple small area and what will happen b which is equal to flux over area b would be very very large and there will be saturation occurring at the strips over there so the advantage of making actually this uh, shape of the teeth over here like this over here is this that the flux lines they can actually flow freely without any congestion at the or saturation at the teeth tips over there now what how teeth tips are going to be important we will discuss this in much detail over there at that time but just for now uh, this is the again and this distance over here as I have told you this distance is uh, your D and L is actually the length of this machine I can't show this one L over there but L is actually the length of the stator core laminations over here uh, another picture of the uh, stator core now here you can see the axial ribs axial ribs are very clearly seen over here you can see the axial ribs very clearly these are the axial ribs over here and these are the axial ribs in which are going to be fitted inside this one the stator slots over here are uh, uh, you can call them a deep slot also but uh, particularly they are somewhere middle in the terms of the slots deep or not deep 
So we'll talk this in much detail. This is a little bit different study. At present, we are not concerned with that one. We are only concerned with the other structure. This is again another slot uh, stator winding or sorry, stator core shown over there. And if I zoom in over there, you can see the laminations over here. All these laminations over here, these, these ones, these are all the laminations and in these laminations, there is certainly going to be a resin added in between each lamination. Otherwise, there is no advantage. One thing very important, in between these laminations, there is going to be a resin added. And in between those resins, there is certainly going to be the flux uh, can pass, but electrically they cannot conduct. It's electrically uh, non-conductor or insulator. Why? Because eddy currents, when they are going to be flowing, very importantly, eddy currents will try to flow in this direction perpendicular to what the flux is flowing. Where is the flux flowing? Flux is flowing through this teeth out, through this teeth out, through this teeth out. So particularly the eddy current currents are going to try to flow perpendicular to this one through the length of the machine over here. So to avoid those eddy currents, laminations are used inside the stator core. As you can see, the laminations are added over there and certainly there will be a resin added in between them. This is again the same thing over there as you can see in three dimensional you can see the paper or the mica sheet that is added after when the winding is placed this mica sheet is either going to be cut or it is going to be turned inside the same slot over there and the overhang which i told you previously this is that overhang the connection between the two ends of the coil which is actually not important for us but it's actually important from the electrical point of view to complete the coil or the path of the current this is called as the overhang and one thing very important this overhang also has a leakage reactant we will discuss this that much also we will have a formula for that one also because they are winding they are going to produce some flux and that flux is not being linking with the machine so not with the rotor so this is an overhang reactance which is being produced because of the overhang winding over here. So this is again a stator slot. You can see the laminations over there. Uh, laminations are not shown actually on the outer wall, but you can see the ribs over here very easily. But it is made up of laminations and the windings are placed inside these slots over there. Uh, a simple picture giving you a slip ring induction motor over there. As you can see, the stator is connected in Y, uh, sorry, delta configuration over here. The stator is connected in delta. The rotor is connected in Y, as I already told you. And then there is this bush and the shaft over there, the rings made up of phosphorus, bronze or brass. And then there is a Y connected resistance over there and you can change the value of the resistance. Yes, certainly in parallel for all three phases. You cannot do this that one phase is going to have a different resistance, another one is going to have a different. It has to be same for all the three phases so that you can have the uh, in, rotor resistance change simultaneously for all the three phases and by which you can actually change the starting torque of your slip ring induction motor. And this is the same picture uh, in just a little bit zoom function over there, the same brass rings or the same phosphorus bronze rings over there and the windings are made over there. Those windings are connected with this three shaft over there and the shaft is certainly rotating and this is a uh, stationary part. One thing very important, this spring over here is stationary. That is actually the carbon or the graphite which are actually constantly in touch with those phosphorus or brass uh, uh, rings over there which are called as slip rings over there. So these are constantly in touch over there so that you can actually have a constant connection either you are short circuiting it or either you are doing some other problem over here by attaching or uh, short circuit current or maybe a starting torque is being produced. Okay, now since we have done the little bit mechanical stuff, I've talked about the rotor, the stator, the types, I've given you a mechanical, how a machine looks like it and I will advise you to actually go on to maybe Google Images and search a lot of uh, induction machines so that you have an idea and uh, maybe possibly if you have an induction machine at your home try to actually open one as well so that you have an idea how an induction machine is and how it actually is working yes certainly not a working one maybe a faulty one which has its winding open circuited so maybe you can open it and try to uh, correct it and do the or rewind that machine okay before i move on towards the main design equation and to derive that design equation the first thing first, uh, how you are actually going to uh, decide an induction machine so that you have an idea that 
how you are going to specify and by specify means that what specifications are necessary for an induction machine whenever it is working. So when I'm talking about specifications, the first and foremost thing whenever you are going to go in uh, is actually the horsepower or the kilowatt of the machine and this is the rated output. This is very important. This is the rated output. This is the output figure. So if it is a two horsepower machine, so this means two multiplied by 746 watts is actually means one, since one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. So this is the uh, horsepower or the kilowatt or rating of that machine. The next thing is it is either a three phase or a single phase machine. That is totally up to you here. We are designing actually a three phase machine. Single phase machines are a little different from this one because of the capacitor added over there. If time is there, we will most probably discuss them in one more lecture over there. The next thing is this that what is the frequency at which you are working since is in Pakistan. We will be knowing that this is actually in uh, 50 hertz. The next thing very very important is the voltage. Now one thing again as I have told you before as well that if the voltage is just written this means that this is actually going to be a line to line voltage and if it is not written then certainly this means it's going to be uh, and if it is written deliberately that it's a phase voltage then certainly this is going to be converted into a phase voltage or you can use the same line to line over there. Next thing very important whenever a designer is going to ask you it's going to tell you that your stator winding is going to be connected in Y or Delta which is a very important and the most important parameter which any consumer is going to give you is actually its speed very importantly and here this is actually NR and which will be close to this will be close to NS approximately because this is an induction machine as I have told you previously if it is working at no load and if the NS is approximately like 1500 RPM you are going to have an NR approximately equal to 1480 or 1490 RPM and as the load will increase this NR and if the machine is designed perfectly this NR will actually go on towards something 1400 or even maybe like 1350 in some cases. So this is very important then uh, the consumer is also going to tell you that you are actually asking for a wound machine or you are actually asking for a squirrel cage machine. This is very very important normally we will uh, limit our study to squirrel cage machines and at the end when we have completed one machine we will design the wound rotor because the rotor is actually different over there the stator remains the very same for even a wound machine over there then uh, the very important thing is this that what type of duty you want to do from that machine which means that for how many hours you are going to work that machine without any rest and that is very important for the thermal stability of that machine so that it can be designed the thermally how you are actually going to have those vents. I have just talked about the axial vents up till now. There will be uh, radial vents also. We will discuss them a little later in this lecture. But for here uh, vents are very very important for uh, deciding if the machine is going to run like for maybe 12 hours, 13 hours continuously with load on it. And if it is working without load then that's different duty. In fact there are some classes over there as far as the types of duties are concerned. We will discuss them when we are talking about the thermal design of the machine over there. The next thing very very important but that is never taken into consideration at least in Pakistan is actually the power factor. Induction machine is a very bad machine for power factor. Why? Because at low loads or at no load the power factor exhibited is not more than 0.3 or 0.4 uh, and when the load is increased then it actually goes on to if it is working at full load it goes on to 0.7 or 0.8 but largely whenever a machine is working at partial load or no load the power factor is very poor and whenever there is a factory or any area where you are having a power factor uh, low you are actually going to have a penalty from the VABDA or you are actually going to attach some capacitors over there so that the power factor improvement can be done over there. The next thing which is again also not considered in Pakistan whenever you are buying a machine is the efficiency but certainly if you are in some uh, class uh, countries such as Europe or maybe in USA efficiency or the class of that machine is very much important I am meaning not by the duty class I am asking with respect to the energy class over there. Then the next thing is the class of insulation. This is again very much important that at what voltage you are actually going to run it. If it is designed for 400 volt what type of insulation is inside it and 
if it is designed for 1000 volt so maybe even 11 kV 11 kV motors are very rare but they are they can be designed so approximately 1000 k 1000 volts or 1 kV is actually the class of insulation normally which we will discuss in uh, this design of this chapter and then the next thing very important one is actually the temperature rise by which I mean just like the same temperature rise that was in transformer uh, if you remember the transformer specification chart we had those 40 slash 50 so similarly there will be a temperature rise over there that how much temperature rise this machine can actually handle and then the very much important one that is the full load current which means that what is the maximum current that machine can actually handle with additional to the full load torque this is very important normally in Pakistan whenever we go to buy a machine even at your home you never ask the full load current they actually just give you an idea that uh, this is the two horsepower machine and this will be adequate for the power for pumping water to two story building or maybe a three story building but normally there is nothing a word given for the current over there because what they have done inside it the material is not good they have not used some resin over there the laminations are of not good quality the binding is not copper it is of aluminium so what happens the current is actually exceeding even the rated values even uh, internationally so what happens the cost of running actually a simple one horsepower machine even for water pumping at your home it's going to be enormous so uh, whenever you are doing it industrially and you are designing a machine certainly the full load current is important because that machine is going to run for like 20 20 plus hours easily or maybe for less time also so this is very very important and the last parameter which is very much important uh, which industrially what is the pull out torque of that machine as I have discussed yesterday this is the maximum torque that can be taken out from the machine subjective to that the windings can take that current out of the uh, stator over there then that pull out torque can be achieved otherwise this cannot be achieved over there so these are some 14 points over here <coughs> so just specifications by which you are going to be actually start a design over here that is the induction motor design now before I proceed on with the design over here some variables which are very much important and they are introduced over here the first variable which I am introducing is EPH and uh, it's self explanatory that this is actually the induced EMF inside the uh, stator winding and this is induced EMF per phase in volts certainly and this will be approximately same as VPH why approximately same uh, because there is going to be certainly some drop across the stator windings and the stator leakage reactant so this E1 or EPH in fact E1 let me write it down E1 is the same as EPH or the phase voltage that is induced EMF per phase over there then uh, the next thing is IPH which is actually the induced uh, current actually or not induced actually it's the actually the current flowing inside so this is the current per phase uh, the next thing is TPH which is actually the turns per phase this is a very important variable because this is going to be deciding how many turns you are going to do in each coil then there is flux phi and this is going to be called as the uh, flux per pole this is going to be called as flux per pole in the air gap this is very important this is flux per pole so if there are two pole machines they will be uh, one pole will be actually having the flux lines going out of it and the other one that is actually the south pole the flux lines entering I am talking with respect to the stator side over there so flux per pole in the air gap and then P very very important figure that is the number of poles uh, in the machine and certainly this is not going to be your prerogative. Uh, the speed is actually going to decide on this one that what is the number of poles the next thing very important that is KW this is called as the winding factor now if you remember in transformer all the windings were done at the same axis now this time the windings are not done on the same axis you have a distributed winding which is distributed in all of the uh, oval 360 degrees over there if even I'm talking about one phase so there is going to be a winding factor and that winding factor is going to be less than or equal to 1 
now rarely you will find a winding which is less than or equal to 1 but normally any winding factor or you, if it is done for stator we are going to call it kws and if it is done for kw uh, r that will be for the rotor but since uh, we are not talking about the rotor at present we are only concerned with the stator at present because we are designing a winding for the stator first uh, rotor will be done when we are discussing about a wound machine but just for now kw or simple kws is actually the winding factor telling you the acceptability of that winding as compared to when the winding was done on the same axis so this will discuss it in much detail at the time comes the next thing which i have introduced in the last lecture also which is called as the average value of the flux density so this is the average value of the flux density in the air gap so i'm using ag for the air gap i'm just trying to use some uh, abbreviations over there the next thing very much important ac this is a very important parameter uh, ac is the ampere conductor this is the ampere conductor per meter of the armature periphery now what this means actually, uh, ampere conductor as the name tells you this means that there is going to be certainly a current and then there is going to be conductor. Now this is not turn just like the transformer this is conductor which means if you are going to multiply this ampere by the TPH you are going to multiply this by 2 because one turn means two conductors. One turn means two conductors. So if you are trying to find out the ampere conductor per meter of the armature periphery now to explain this let me go back over here on some stator over there for example this is the stator over here now supposedly you had approximately let me use another color over here uh, if i have approximately in this slot there were like supposedly just for example there were like 10 turns over here okay and since one turn whenever it is done it's going to be 10 turns over here, 10 turns over here like this. So based on it, in all of the slots, how many turns are there or how many conductors are there, find them, multiply it by the current value which is flowing inside those conductors and certainly this is a three phase machine. So it will be uniform current in all the three phases and divide that value of ampere conductors by what? By this circumference of the inner diameter. Okay, the circumference of the inner bore of the machine. So what I mean by this, let me just write down the formula over here. So what is AC? AC is equal to the number of IPH multiplied by number of turns per phase because this will give me the number of ampere turns. Now if I multiply this by 2, this will give me the number of ampere conductors because one turn means two conductors because if one turn is going over here the other turn is coming over here so this is two conductors over there so IPH multiplied by TPH into two is going to be the total number of ampere conductors per phase now since there are three phases in the machine we just multiply it by three and we divide it by this distance over here which is the inner diameter circumference so this means if i divide it by pi d what is d d is this diameter over here in fact let me just use another color again so if this diameter was equal to d the circumference of this inner bore is actually going to be pi d so ac that is actually the ampere conductors per meter and again d has to be in meters we all will always remain in the si units over there so AC is equal to 3 into IPH into TPH turns per phase multiplied by 2 because each turn has two conductors so that's why it's being multiplied by 2 and this 3 over here is being added because it's a three phase machine and pi D is actually the circumference over there. So what is this AC telling me that in one meter of this distance how many ampere conductors are there. So if I go back over there in AC definition which I just done. AC is actually the ampere conductors per meter of the armature periphery over here. So AC very very important term 
we'll discuss it just now that what is the effect of this AC and all that stuff next thing very important one uh, let me just complete this one and then I will go on towards the proof over there this is D so what is D over here as I have told you this is the armature diameter of the stator bore this is the armature diameter of the stator bore and certainly it has to be in meter and then certainly the next thing L which I have already defined with you this is the stator core length again in meter and then uh, uh, since we have talked about NS what was NS this was the speed of the magnetic field in RPM now same thing if I just divide this NS by 60 so this would be small NS now this is very important in this proof remain it has to be confirmed very carefully that NS is equal to now the speed of the magnetic field in RPS that is revolutions per second so NS capital is in minutes small NS is in RPS that is revolutions per second next thing is the efficiency so this is the efficiency of the machine so this is the efficiency of the machine which you are eyeing over here the next thing is the cos of phi or actually the power factor of the uh, machine and certainly uh, this is the power factor maybe at full load or maybe at no load the time will come when we will decide on this one cos of theta normally it is done for the full load over there the last thing but very very important thing is tau now what is this tau tau symbol just like the torque symbol over there we normally use it this tau is called as the pole pitch and this pole pitch formula is equal to pi d and what is pi d I, we just done it now pi d was the circumference of the inner bore of the stator over there and we divide it by p now what this means over there pole pitch means if I go back on the same diagram or maybe I can choose another diagram over here let me just use this one over there now if you are seeing this one this circumference over here is equal to pi d so now you have this pi d over there now if this stator had four poles okay if this stator had four poles so supposedly for example uh, you have to divide this hall in this four parts over there so maybe in this portion you would had north pole you had south pole and you had again a north pole and you had again a south pole this is the four pole machine and this all four poles they are rotating at a speed nf and this can be clockwise or anti-clockwise so what is tau over here tau is equal to pi d divided by the number of poles p so what is this p tau tau is actually the distance from the center of one pole to the distance so the next consecutive pole over there or it is actually the span of one pole over here that is the length of the north pole or south pole in your machine now if you had like four poles this p would be equal to four if this was two this will be in the denominator it will be two otherwise this pole pitch as the name suggests over there this tau is giving you pi d is the circumference and dividing it by p gives you the pole pitch over here on the stator side over there and this is a very very important term because we are going to use this term in our uh, proofs later on I hope this is clear from this point okay now since we have done all these parameters over here and all these parameters EPH, IPH, TPH, flux phi, P, KW which is actually the winding factor BAV, AC, D, L, capital NS, small NS, efficiency, cos of theta and pole pitch are there now I want to go towards the proof first <clears throat> but uh, before I go on towards the proof one more thing we already know the formula that is NS is equal to 120 F by P now uh, since this is equal to capital NS I if I want to convert this into small NS I will divide on both sides by 60 so what is going to be there this is going to be divided by so this will be 2 F divided by P and if I want to write this or rearrange this equation this will be F equal to P N S divided by 2 I'm going to use this uh, relation of frequency 
uh, in the proof over here so that's why I actually read it so this is frequency in terms of the revolutions per second revolving speed of the magnetic field over there okay now if I want to go towards the proof now if you remember transformer we started with the KVA rating formula that was for the core type or the shell type over there similarly over here if I have a machine and I am talking in respect to KVA this will be equal to 3 EPH IPH into 10 raised to power minus 3 and certainly this will be the KVA rating on this side but in fact uh, I don't need to write this KVA over here because it's already 10 raised to power minus 3 written over there. So this is 3 EPH IPH into 10 raised to power minus 3 the KVA rating of your machine. Now this EPH if you remember your transformer uh, this EPH was equal to EPH or simple E was equal to 4.44 F flux phi into N. This was your transformer if you remember it. Now same thing you are going to add this one over here and in this time this EPH this was actually for the transformer. Now when I am going to use this for the induction machine this per phase voltage or induced EMF EPH inside the induction machine is going to be equal to 4.44 F will remain the same flux per pole will remain the same and instead of N here there is going to be TPH because this is the terms per phase here we are using the word term or the uh, variable TPH and we are going to have the factor KW also added why because KW is the binding factor and I just told you that the practical value of number of turns which are happening is dependent upon how the winding is distributed over there. This KW factor is always going to be less than 1 and normally this value will be limited to something 0 0.5, 0 0.6 or sorry not 0 0.9, 5, 0 0.96 or 0 0.89 or something near about. So your EPH is equal to this form over there and now we are going to put it in this equation. Now before I move on further and put in this equation over here, uh, we just declared what was BAV. Now what is BAV? BAV is the average flux density inside the air gap. And what is air gap? Air gap is actually the region between the stator and the rotor. Now we have defined just in this variable what was flux phi. Now what was flux phi? Fly flux phi was the flux per pole in the air gap over here so if I have known that what is flux per pole in the air gap so uh, BAV I can write it down equal to the total flux phi of T divided by the total area in which that flux is actually evident so what is the total flux since I know the flux per pole I can find out total flux phi multiply it by P because flux phi was the flux per pole and P is equal to the number of poles over there. So this will be a total flux over there. Now if I want to have this AT, this is very important over there. What is this AT over here? This AT is the total area that is over there in the machine. Now if I go back on my machine over there, just for example, if I want to take a three dimensional view of this one. now what is that area from where the flux lines are actually entering over there now if you see this very closely in this uh, three dimensional picture all this area which is in this inside area certainly including the other side as well all this area which is actually having a circumference of pi d that is actually combined with the total length of the machine that is l so the total area in which this total flux is flowing is called as pi d l. What is pi d? Pi d is the circumference of this inner one and what is the depth of this cylinder which is inside over there? This is l. So the area at which the flux is entering that total flux phi of t is equal to pi d l. So in this formula over here just now I just read over there this uh, over here b a v is equal to phi p divided by let me change the color back to so this is equal to pi d l over here so b a v is equal to p phi by by d l i will be using this one 
uh, in my design again also and the next thing which I have already proven in front of you just back this was AC that was equal to 3 into 2 into TPH into IPH divided by pi of B over here. So this is your AC and this is the armature conductors or ampere conductors per meter of the armature periphery. So now I am going to use this one, this one and these three combined with this NS P by 2 which is equal to F over here and use this one in this formula which is KVA is equal to 3 EPH into TP IPH into 10 raised to power minus 3 over there. So now if I just write it down over there, uh, let me just put it over here in this fashion. So now the KVA is equal to 3 <coughs> into, if I now have, I am putting uh, the EPH formula. So this is 4.44 KW into F into flux phi into TPH into IPH into 10 raised to power minus 3. Now this formula is very simple over there. Now here instead of this F I can write over here this formula which I have proven over there. F is equal to P and S divided by 2. So this means this is going to be 3 into 4.44 KW into uh, P N S. Oh, sorry this is going to be small N S. Uh, N S divided by 2 multiplied by. Now here you have flux phi over there and I can now put this flux phi from this relation over there because from here I can write it down that flux phi is equal to B A V into pi D L divided by P over there. So in place of phi over there I am going to write it as B A V into pi D L divided by uh, actually this was P over there in a denominator so this is P added over there. The next thing I have TPH into IPH. Now if you remember this AC formula, I have TPH and IPH. So from this AC formula, I can write down that TPH into IPH is equal to AC into pi D divided by, I can write just 6 or it is 3 into 2 over there. So over here instead of TPH and IPH, I will write it as AC into pi d divided by uh, 3 into 2 and then the last term which is actually just a constant which is actually 10 raised to power minus 3. Now there are some things which can be cancelled very easily this is 3 and 3 have been cancelled 2 and 2 and this comes out to be 1.11 and then I have some terms over here which are can be combined together this is equal to 1.11 and since this is 1 pi and 1 pi so I can write this one as pi square and then I have my KW then I have my BAV and then I have my AC over there and this can be combined with the 10 raised to power minus 3 term over there and the remaining one since this is D this is D so this comes out to be D square L over here and with this term there is the speed which is NS. So what is now this term over here which I have written the KV rating of your machine or induction machine is equal to 1.11 pi square constant KW constant Y constant because this is the winding which you are actually going to decide which type of winding BAV is also your design value that how much BAV you want inside your air gap as I have discussed in the last lecture also that the average flux density inside the air gap is going to be something 0.4 to 0.6 or even for larger machines maybe something 0.7 AC is the armature or ampere conductors per meter I will discuss in much detail maybe in the next lecture but just for now this is the also a uh, design value and this is 10 raised to power minus 3 the remaining parameters are d square l into s ns is always given because this is a specification value which is going to be given by your manufacturer or sorry your consumer so this can be said that your kva is equal to c naught into d square l into ns so this is the first design equation which you are getting where c naught is equal to 1.1 pi square into kw b a v a c into 10 raised to power minus 3 so this C naught has a similar value just like that K over there but we are not going to actually have that K uh, C naught assumed over there because we will have a value 
selected for BAV and for the AC that is actually the ampere conductors per meter but what this equation is telling me from here that if you know your KVA value you know your NS that is actually the RPS that is actually the revolutions per second over there so you can decide if you have calculated your C0 you can decide D square L and what is D square L uh, this D square is well not purely true but this is actually the volume of the machine over here when you are actually having the machine in the stator bore over there it is called as the volume of the machine but it can't be said as the exact value of the volume of the machine but D square L parameter from here so I can write this one as D square L and if I can write this equation over here as D square L equal to KVA divided by C naught into NS. Now what this equation is telling me that the volume or the size of the machine, let's call it as the size of the machine, is directly proportional to the KVA. If you have a KVA machine, KVA of the machine is large, you are going to have larger size of the machine. But okay, let's assume you have a KVA of the machine required by your consumer you are requiring a C0 value larger enough so that your D square L which is actually the size of the machine is small. So if you are going to select smaller value of C0 which means you are going to have smaller value of BAV, you are going to have smaller value of AC, you will have the size of the machine reduced over there. But over here if you are going to select C0 over here a smaller value you are going to have a larger size of your machine so C0 which is directly proportional to BAV and C0 proportional to AC you are actually going to have your size of the machine dependent on these two variables BAV and AC the next parameter is actually the speed now if you have a very machine which you are designing and that speed is something 3000 RPS or even more than that something so what you are actually aiming at if your speed is higher your size of the machine is smaller so but this is not in our control why because the speed is a parameter that is given by the consumer that okay we want a machine of this speed so this is not in your control so the only parameter which is in your control is actually C0 and C0 as you can see in this equation the 1.1 is a constant figure, pi square is also a constant figure, kW is a winding prerogative, it's not controlled by you. The only two parameters which you can control is BAV and AC. BAV is the average flux density inside the air gap and AC is the ampere conductors per meter of the armature periphery. So these two components are very very important and I will just discuss these two in the next lecture very start over here. So I will just end this lecture over here <coughs> and this is the first design equation for the induction motor done today and this D square L now one thing very important D square L is called as the volume or the size of the machine but still we have no way of actually separating D and L we will discuss in the next lecture that how you can separate that D and L from there and based on that D and L separation then you will decide okay this is the diameter of the stator board and you know the length of the machine and then you can decide how the machine is actually going to work in that sense. I hope this is clear. So this is lecture number two for the induction machine and we have just started the design of the induction machine. I have given you the first design equation of the induction machine that is KVA is equal to C naught D square L into NF. Thank you.